So we're now going to move on to talk about some of more of the theoretical foundations of uh, reduced order modeling, and particular thinking about as a, in one of the original ways was formulated as continuous variables. These PDs that we're solving are continuous functions, and there's a whole formulation, and we're going to dive into how to do this, in which we can make connection between that continuous formulation and this SVD-based POD reduction that we've been doing with snapshots. Again, this is out of Data Science and Engineering with Kutz and Brunton, and it's databookuw.com. You'll find everything there, including extensive notes. Uh, so again, let's recall what we're trying to do. In a reduced order model, the idea is to take some PDE, which under discretization is usually some very high dimensional uh, ODE solve, uh, typically that's so large that you'd like to find some way to reduce that down into an R-dimensional subspace in which that proxy model is a faithful representation of the true state. So that's either called a proxy or a surrogate model, and that's what we want to build. Some model that's much easier to simulate is in lower dimensions so that it's more tractable computationally. That's the structure of ROMs, and so it's about finding that subspace projecting into that subspace. So uh, I want to highlight how we might do this because up to this point, what we've been talking about is this idea of a low rank formulation. And here is this sort of optimization that we're really doing when we do the POD. The idea is to say, if I take my data matrix X, I'm going to project in some, some subspace spanned by these rows of columns of phi, which are the first R columns of the SVD of X, so that when I project into the subspace, reproject back out, it gives me the best reconstruction approximation. In fact, that's exactly essentially the definition of what the SVD is doing. It's giving you the optimal reconstruction for a given R rank subspace. So this is the definition of that. So this isn't a discrete formulation, right? So what we did is we discretized time and space, took snapshots, and in that case, when we do the SVD, this is sort of the optimization problem that it's actually solving for building the subspace. So the question is, but we want to go to our PD variables again, which is u of xt. And t is over some domain, 0 to big T. x is over negative L to L. So one of the questions you can ask is, yeah, but this is a continuous variable, and how do we think about approximating this continuous variable with some discrete representation here, which is discretized space, discretized time, and doing the SVD? And I want to come and address this because there's a formulation here in the continuous space that we can work with, even from a theoretical point of view, but also show you how it connects back up to this here. All right, so what we're going to do uh, is first of all, make sure we have the definition of our inner product right. Everything's typically about projections, and so when you do projections, uh, you're going to have to take inner products. That's how you get your projection and the contribution into a projective space is through an inner product calculation. And so here's just standard definition of the inner product, which is integrate over the spatial variable, f times g conjugate. Okay, so the star there is the complex conjugate of g. Dx, okay, so that's our inner product definition. That's what we're going to work with. We're standard L2 norm measure for functions. Okay, and what we're going to do now is then formulate the continuous optimization problem that's going to be equivalent to that discrete version. And here it is. I'm going to run this thing from over some time period, 1 to t. So I'm going to have a, a 1 over t here, so it's going to average over the time. Uh, integrate from time 0 to t. And here's what we're integrating. The norm of u minus u projected onto this some basis phi of x, and then that inner product projected back on phi. So this here is equivalent to that discrete version, but now we're integrating over time and space. Notice the inner products here are, it's an integral over from negative L to L, and then this is over all of time. Subject to, and I want to have this norm constraint on my modes. Okay, right? So the unit length. So the goal is to minimize this. In other words, if I have a very good projection, then, in fact, if the projection is perfect, then this would be zero. In other words, I would get no difference between my actual 
you and the projected you. But of course, typically when we project, we're always going to get an error. But the point is, find the best phi that in fact make this error minimal. So that's the continuous formulation. And again, let's just recall that this is the discrete formulation of SVD. So in one way to think about it is, this is sort of the, uh, this is this same optimization, but out in continuous variables. You integrate over time and space instead of snapshots. And your inner products, instead of being just dot products with vectors, now the inner products are, in fact, continuous over some integral of the spatial domain. Okay, so these are sort of your equivalent formulations of trying to do the same thing. And here, the idea was to take a subspet of, subspace of rank R and minimize this. And here, what we want to do is start now also thinking about how do I construct a functional space and, and modes so that, in fact, I can formulate this continuous version as an optimization problem and get a solution out. So what we're going to do is we're going to start formulating this continuous formulation. And in fact, instead of looking at minimizing this, really minimizing this is equivalent to maximizing this. In other words, maximize my mode, its projection onto the function u. And so that's what we're actually going to look at from the uh, optimization point of view is optimize that inner product. And if you optimize that inner product, it will make the fit minimal subject to this constraint of, orthonormal, of, orth, of orthonormality, which is unit length vectors, or unit length, unit length functions, actually. So this is what I want to do my optimization on. That's the constraint. So I'm actually going to formulate this as a constraint optimization problem. It's a simple constraint to add on. And so we do this through, uh, you know, adding a Lagrange multiplier. Just say, look, I want this thing to be maximized. And now with the constraint that uh, there it is, that I want that thing essentially to be zero. So one minus the norm is supposed to be one. Okay. And so I put that Lagrange multiplier on there and I want to uh, uh, find the extremal values of this. Okay, so to do the extremal values, here is what we're going to do. We're going to minimize this by taking the partials of that Lagrangian with respect to psi star. Okay, so remember psi and psi star are uh, both going to be in here in this inner product. So psi is the, the wave function. The inner product's going to give me a psi star when I use my definition of inner product. Remember, it's f g star, so part of it will be a, have a complex conjugate. Now we take the partial derivatives, set it to zero with respect to v star. Okay, so at this point, we're just differentiating, right? Setting up uh, a Lagrange multiplier problem, differentiating. This is like the simplest optimization, perhaps one of the first that we learned in calculus, constrained optimization probably learned in calculus. What you end up getting after a little bit of algebra, not even that much algebra, is that in fact the solution to that optimization problem gives you this here as an eigenvalue problem for psi. And the eigenvalue problem is a little different than we normally, it's, a, it's an integral equation. In particular, you have an inner product here of R against psi is equal to lambda psi. So that's your eigenvalue problem, where r is defined as 1 over t, integral 0 to t, of u, u star. So this is interesting. So what you get out of here, this is the correlation of u, with its, of u to u star. So this is your covariance matrix for every point c and u, x, right, in discrete form. So this is very nice. It's not surprising that this come out, comes out, right? So this is your correlations across the data. So you take your field and you look at the maximal correlations. This is exactly what the SVD or PODs are doing is they're looking at all the data, looking at maximal directions of correlation and pulling those out. That's exactly what this quantity is doing for us. And notice that what we get is we get the eigenvalues and ionic vectors of this as being the modes along with the eigenvalues telling us something about the energy in those modes. Okay, so it's, it's looking a lot like an SVD, but now in a continuous formulation. So this is what we have here in the formulation of the problem. And at the, this point, it's, uh, so if you look at some of the literature that's there, 
uh, Lumley, Holmes, others wrote a book on POD and the way they introduced this idea of POD and model reduction is in this context as a continuous variable and they get to this point and then say, well, now I got to evaluate that integral. And that's when we make connection to the snapshot-based POD method. In particular, I've got to do this integral. So let's go talk about what doing that integral gives us. We're going to now take this integral, and I'm going to look at it in discrete form. In other words, let's go ahead and discretize u. So now I have spatial positions, and so now that inner product right here becomes dot products. These are vectors now. Just go back here. Here, right, I'm integrating over. It's going to be inner product that I have here. When I do this inner product of this, it's going to be integrating over all of space. But now, I'm looking at this, and I'm going to take an inner product here is going to be a dot product because now these are vectors. Okay, So this is what the operator R looks like. And what I want to do is calculate eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this operator, this R. So I still have this integral to do here, which goes over all of time. We're going to do one more discretization. I've discretized space. Now let's discretize time because I want to do that integral right there. And the minute I discretize time, it's interesting. So how are you going to solve an integral? There's a lot of different ways to numerically compute integrals. The simplest integration technique for integrals is trapezoid rule. And let me show you what trapezoid rule gives you. If I take this system now and say R is 1 over T, this continued formulation, but now I do trapezoid rule on it, Notice what I've done. Trapezoid rule just is simply given right by here. So you just, you basically make your integral up of a, of a bunch of trapezoids, add them together. And this is actually the formula for the trapezoid rule. It's not, it's about as simple as it gets. You learn this in calculus, integral calculus, in the various earliest stages. Add up to a bunch of rectangles, that's the integral. Take the limit, goes, delta t goes to zero, but now we're just one step back. We don't take delta t to zero. We just add up those tra uh, those rectangles. Notice what you get here. U star T1, U T1. U star T2, T2. These are all vector products that I can write down here in summary form. And the thing I want to point out to you, if this is R, it is directly related then to the correlation, mechan correlation uh, matrix that you get if you consider SVD of data collected like this. So now we could say, yeah, but when we were collecting data before in X in an X matrix, U1 through U of M, the SVD modes were eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this correlation matrix here, which is exactly what R was defined as. So this is the connection from the continuous to the discrete version. In the discrete version, we just simply took snapshots like this, and we said, what are the SVD modes? And what you're seeing is that the SVD modes, well, that was coming from looking essentially at the covariance matrices of X, which is exactly the definition of R in the trapezoidal rule. So let me try to just give you the summary statement. This is very important, right, of making this connection between a continuous formulation to a discrete formulation. In the continuous formulation, it is equivalent to the POD snapshot methods that we've been talking about when you use the trapezoid rule to evaluate your time integration piece that's inside of that continuous formulation. And if you do that, they are exactly equivalent. Now, which begs the question, there are a lot of interesting and better integration routines Right? Even, you know, almost nobody uses trapezoidal rule in practice. You might use Simpson's rule as a base and higher order accuracy schemes from there. So one of the questions you could ask is, well, what would happen if you use something like Simpson's rule instead of the trapezoid rule? What would that mean? And what would be the impact of that? Well, here's what it would mean. In the trapezoid rule, you would essentially be looking then for your data matrices X to be take this form, snapshots of this system, and looking at the SVD of this matrix X, which is going to give you the correlation 
uh, covariance matrices, eigenvectors and eigenvalues of those covariance matrices. But with Simpson's rule, you would be actually looking at this matrix, this matrix of data X here, which is U1, 4U2, 2U3, 4U4, all the way through, all the way to U of M. It's very different. So this gives you actually better modal reconstructions than this. So notice what you've done. You can do high order integration schemes by simply arranging your data in a different way and reweighting the data according to some principled architecture like a Simpson's rule versus a trapezoidal rule. And this actually gets you better approximations to your data because in fact you've used a high order difference uh, integration scheme than you would than using just a trapezoid scheme. So this is actually an interesting uh, perspective to think about because it's not, it's not commonly thought about. Most people just take snapshots, use them, but actually you could get improvements just by doing something as simple as rearranging your data and reweighting it, and that would give you, in fact, better POD modes to do approximations with. Uh, mostly I wanted to though highlight that there is a very much a connection between theoretical constructs of the continuous formulation of the variables to its discretized versions, and that when you get to the discretized versions and the standard implementation of ROM architectures, there's a lot of assumptions being made, including trapezoid rule being at the base of that. So just have that in mind as you work with these models and that there's lots of room for improvements uh, in different ways of thinking about evaluating these, these continuous versions of the models and their approximations in the discrete setting. Okay, you can find more here, databookudub.com, uh, and you can find the notes, the PDF form, all the code, more lectures on reduced order models as well.